false musical consciousness. Stravinsky also asserts his right to an extreme position in the modern music movement. The capitulation of this movement can be measured in his compositions both in terms of their specific individual character and the progression from work to work. Today, however, an aspect has become evident for which he cannot directly be blamed and which is only latently indicated in the changes in his compositional procedures. The collapse of all criteria for good or bad music, as they had been codified during the early days of the bourgeois era. For the first time, dilettantes everywhere are launched as great composers. Musical life, which is now by and large economically centralized, forces the public to recognize them. Twenty years ago, the trumped-up glory surrounding Elgar seemed a, a local phenomenon and the fame of Sibelius an exceptional case of critical ignorance. Phenomena of such a niveau, even if they are at times more liberal in their use of dissonances, are the norm today. From the middle of the 19th century on, good music has renounced commercialism altogether. The consequence of its further development has come into conflict with the manipulated and at the same time self-satisfied needs of the bourgeois public. The pathetically small number of connoisseurs was gradually replaced by all those who could afford the price of a ticket and wished to demonstrate their culture to others. An abyss developed between public taste and compositional quality. Works of quality established themselves in the repertoire only through the strategy of the composer, in itself not always in the best interest of his work or through the enthusiasm of competent musicians and critics. Radically modern music could no longer count on this support. Quality may be determined according to the same standards in advanced works as well as in traditional works, perhaps even more easily, despite the limitations of these standards. The prevailing musical language no longer removes the burden of accuracy and integrity from the shoulders of the composer. At the same time, the self-appointed mediators have sacrificed their capacity to make such judgments. Since the compositional procedure is gouged simply according to the inherent form of every work, not according to tacitly accepted general demands, it is no longer possible to, quote, learn, unquote, definitively what constitutes good or bad music. Whoever would pass judgment must face squarely the immutable questions and antagonisms of the individual compositional structure, about which no general music history can teach. No one could be better suited to this task than the progressive composer whom discursive reasoning most eludes. He can no longer depend upon mediators between himself and the public. Critics live literally according to the quote, high reason, end of quote, expressed in the song by Gustav Mahler. They evaluate according to what they do and do not understand. Critics live literally according to the high reason expressed in the song by Gustav Mahler. They evaluate according to what they do and do not understand. Performing, performing musicians, however, particularly conductors, allow themselves to be guided altogether by those characteristics which are the most obviously effective and comprehensible in the composition to be performed. Consequently, the opinion that Beethoven is comprehensible and Schoenberg incomprehensible is an objective deception. The general public, totally cut off from the production of new music, is alienated by the outward characteristics of such music. The deepest currents present in this music proceed, however, from exactly those sociological and anthropological foundations peculiar to that public. The dissonances which horrify them testify to their own conditions. For that reason alone do they find them unbearable. 
Exactly the opposite is the case of the all too familiar, which is so far removed from the dominant forces of life today that the public's own experience scarcely still communicates with that for which traditional music bore witness. Whenever they believe to understand, they perceive really only a dead mold, which they guard tenaciously as their unquestionable possession and which is lost precisely in that moment that it becomes a possession. An indifferent showpiece, neutralized and robbed of its own critical substance. Actually, it is only the coarsest vulgarities and easily remembered fragments, ominously beautiful passages, moods, and associations which find their way into the comprehension of the public. Musical continuity, the true basis of meaning in the composition, is no less hidden from the radio train listener in an early Beethoven sonata than it is in a Schoenberg quartet, which at least reminds him that his sky does not consist entirely of clouds with silver linings upon whose radiance he can forever feast his eyes. This is not to say by any means that a work may be immediately accessible only in its own epoch and after that time must necessarily fall victim to depravity and historicism. There is a sociological collective tendency which is burned out of the consciousness and unconsciousness of men that humanity which once lay at the foundations of today's residue of commercial musical supply. This tendency permits only an irresponsible echo of the idea of humanity and the empty ritual of the concert, whereas the philosophical heritage of good music has become the province of those forces scorned by the heirs of this heritage. The music industry, which further degrades this musical supply by galvanizing it into a shrine, merely confirms the state of consciousness of the listener for whom the harmony of Viennese classicism attained through bitter sacrifice and the bursting longing of romanticism have both been placed upon the market as household ornaments. <laughs>